Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining me in this session where I will be teaching you how to build your MVP using no code on a tool called Softer. So if you're brand new to no code and you're wondering what all the fuss is about, no code is pretty much a way of building websites and apps, but you can do it using tools that do not require you to know or to write code. And therefore, it empowers people like myself, who I'm a lawyer by training, for instance. It enables non-technical people to quickly execute on your ideas and make sure that you don't have to wait for someone to build it out for you. It enables you to be your own CTO. And while no-code tools were not very powerful until a few years ago, there's new tools that have come up recently. And... Older tools have gotten incredibly powerful in the last couple of years. And so that being taken really seriously and anyone who's interested in launching their own ideas, they are training themselves in no code. Apart from that, if you are interested in a career in no code, there are many startups and companies who are actively hiring for no code developers. So if that is a career path that you're interested in, all of this knowledge will be useful for you there as well. So to get started with this session, um, this particular workshop is going to be about one hour long, and I will be around for Q&A later. So it's a little more than one hour. But in this session, what we're going to be doing is learning how to use a tool, a no-code tool to build out an idea. And the curriculum has been designed in a way to use this knowledge that you're going to learn to help you with any idea that you might have. So it, it sort of, it, it will work with uh, e-commerce, it will work with a personal website, it will work with the company intranet, or as the use case that we'll be dealing with today, it will be useful for spinning up um, directories, niche specific directories that will be useful to attract audiences for your ideas. So what we'll be doing is we're going to start with the very basics and we're going to cover some uh, a few very important concepts in the no-code world that you can use in other tools as well. Today we're using Softer. Uh, by the way, please click here to sign up for Softer if you do not have uh, an account already. But the link to this worksheet, if you're not sure where it is, it's in the bottom of the event page where you already signed up. I'm just going to share that link again. And also, if there's people who've joined a little late and I get started with the building part of the session, I request you to please share that in the chat in case someone asks. But yeah, let's get started with this. So make sure that you have a software account because that's what we'll be using today. And the second tool that we do need for today is Airtable. All the tools that we'll be using today are in the worksheet. You don't need all of them, but you do need software and Airtable. What you're seeing on screen right now is Notion. Notion is a really useful project management tool. If you don't, haven't used it before, I do have a bunch of free tutorials on how you can use it for a range of use cases for your business and otherwise. So do check that out as well. All right. So before I get into the building part of the session and heads up, you are going to build this app with me, which is to say that you're going to open this video on one tab and make sure that um, you open another window and build this with me. And at the end of the session, you do have a working prototype of, of, of an app that works for all of us. So before we get to the building part and before you know, I, I give you a couple of minutes to open softer, I just wanted to tell you how any app works. Um, and of course, sort of this is simplifying it, but no matter what no-code tool you use, there's always going to be three components to an app. The first one is the front end. The front end is nothing but what the user sees on their screen, whether it's a computer or a phone or a tab, whatever someone sees on the screen is the UX part, which is the user experience or user interface, which is the front end. So that's the front part of the app. There is also the back end where there is logic, 
where there are workflows running in the background, where when a button is clicked, take them to this page, or when a button is clicked, run an automation in the background, send an email when a user signs up for a new account. All of that is backend logic. So those are all called workflows, right? So there's front end, and then there's stuff that people can't see, but they're running in the background, that's workflows. And then a very important part of an app is data structures, okay? so. Your front end is the design, what people are seeing. The workflows are basically the logic. And the data structures is basically the data that will be used for the logic and to be displayed on the front end. Now, to explain this with an example, if you open facebook.com, your branded page that you're seeing with the trademark Facebook blue and everything, that's the front end of what you're seeing. When you click on sign up and it's asking you for email, password and everything. And when you click on that sign up button, it sends you an email to your inbox saying, welcome to Facebook. That happens because of a workflow that's running in the background. And finally, when you whatever email that you've submitted, your first name and last name, all of that gets sent to Facebook servers into their database. So that is, that is how they structure their data. And why data structures are important is because let's say Facebook right now, let's say it has about a billion users. Facebook does not have a billion pages. Facebook.com does not have a billion pages, each for each user, right? Even though all of us have our unique usernames and profile IDs, there's, there aren't a billion pages that Facebook has created for each of us. Instead, Facebook has actually created one template web, web page, which has a skeleton of you know, where the image should go, the full name, the location, their friends and about me and all of that. They have one page. So that is displayed on the front end. And then when you click on someone's profile name or you enter facebook.com slash Krishna the workflow gets triggered and the template page gets displayed with the right data being pulled from the database. And this, is, this was a really big uh, realization for me when I first started learning app development because I was under the impression that you create different pages you know, in, inside a web page. And so if there are like 100 instances of people on a web page, website, then they will have 100 different web pages. But that's not how it works. It is just one template being displayed in a billion different ways. Um, and which is exactly why uh, all web pages for all profiles look exactly the same. The picture is in the same place, it has the same frame, and so on and so forth, right. So I just wanted to give you an understanding of how the how any app works. And in today's case, uh, let me just tell you what we're going to be doing. As you know, we're going to be using a tool called Softer. When you sign up for Softer using the link that I've given you, this is the page that you end up in. Because uh, if you're a beginner, you might not have all of these applications. Maybe it's completely blank. But what Softer will do is it'll allow you to create a new application by clicking on this button. Let me tell you what Softer will do. Softer or any other tool for that matter, you might use Glide, you might use Webflow, you might use Bubble. All of these are no-code tools, by the way. Uh, if you want a list of no-code tools that you want to use or you want to explore after this session, you do have a list of post-workshop resources that you can explore a little later. But what any of those tools will do, and specifically now so what software will do, is software will make it really easy for you to build a front end, okay? So you can build a beautiful website. It gives you a bunch of templates, which we'll be using today to make it really fast. Uh, it will run these workflows for you without having to code it out. It's gonna be really simple to set up these workflows as long as you know what you want it to do. And then finally, it makes it really simple for you to manage your database. The thing about software is that software allows you to manage a database, your database on a bunch of solutions, including Google Sheets. So let's say you have a list of um, maybe usernames 
or whatever your directory that is that you're building, let's say you have it on Google Sheets, you can directly build a software app from that Google Sheet. Similarly with Glide, glideapps.com, they also allow you to connect an app with a Google Sheet, right? So these are really great places to get started when you're just starting with no code and useful, really powerful uh, tools for your MVP. The thing about software is it allows you to connect to another database management solution, which is similar to Google Sheets. It's called Airtable, which is the other tool that we'll be using today. You can sign up for it. So Airtable is like Google Sheets, but it's incredibly powerful. Uh, if you've used Notion before, you might know about Notion databases, right? So Airtable is exactly like Notion databases, except much more powerful. So those are just a couple of things that I wanted to cover before we can go ahead. What we'll be doing today is that I already have made a database for you just in the interest of saving time. So all you have to do is duplicate that database. After the session, you can completely change and customize that database, of course, but just make sure that you've duplicated this Airtable base, right? So the link to that is in the worksheet here and here, it's the same thing. So when you click on this link, what happens is that it takes you to the database that is powering the app that we'll be building today. Okay, so you could duplicate this. And before we see how the database is even working, let me show you the app that we'll be building today. So this is the fictional use case. The fictional use case is you want to build, uh, so, so you are interested in um, sustainability. You're interested in living a uh, green life and you wanna influence other people. You wanna inspire other people to go green essentially, and you want to tell people that they should probably be looking at brands that help the environment. And so to make it easy for them, you want to build an app to connect people to these brands that are doing some really good work in the uh, climate space or the sustainability space. So the app that we'll be building today is actually here you could refer the app it's called go green that's what i'm calling it so it gives you a directory of green brands which are basically all these brands that are, are doing well in the in the in, in the particular space for instance you have a company called beyond meat which creates plant based meat right so this is just a directory of all of these brands that are environmentally conscious and you want to give this list instead of creating an extensive Excel sheet or maybe a Google sheet, because it looks a little better, you wanna create something like this. So in the browser, you can see that the link to this directory is right here. And you can just share this as a website link. It's incredibly responsive. So this will open really well on a, on a mobile as well. What happens in this website? Let's just take a look at this. It has a title. It has a list of these brands. You can actually click here to see more. And on the top, if you see the header, it says sign in to submit a brand. So if you're a user of this website and you're signed in, you can actually submit recommendations to this particular list. So if I sign in, okay, we'll fix that in a bit. But when you sign in, it will scroll it down to this place. Let's just sign in using a dummy account. When you sign in, what happens is, is the, the, this page is the same, but the header is now different, right? The header is now saying all brands, which is the page that we're on right now, but it's giving you an option now to submit a brand. When you click on submit a brand, now you have an option to actually add to the list that we're seeing. Let's say we say test one, test brand one, and the type of the brand could be maybe electronics. Um, you could just say Lauren Epsom just some dummy text. You could upload a picture just to see how it works. Uh, let me just up upload my picture. And this is the link to the brand's website. I'll just give the link to my website. And now when I click on submit brand, it is now saying thank you for adding a brand. Now, if I go to all brands and scroll down to the bottom, 
you can now see that I have actually added a brand, right? So what we've just done is basically uh, two parts of app building. So typically when you build apps uh, that take users' data, they read users' data, they allow you to update stuff, they allow you to delete stuff. They're called CRUD apps. CRUD stands for C-R-U-D, create, read, update, and delete. And all of these no-code tools will allow you to build functionality like this. What we've done so far is the C and R. R is reading. So we have data somewhere and we are displaying all of that data. We're reading all of that data on the front end. And we're also satisfying the C condition, which is create. We're allowing a user, as long as they're signed in, they can actually create a record on the directory, right? So C and R. So that is what we will be covering today's uh, in today's workshop. The U and D, if you actually master C, R, C and R of this part of the session, uh, the U and D is actually quite straightforward. I do, I have given you a couple of resources in, in exploring that part a little more, but it's pretty much the same logic. So let's get started on building it. Hopefully you, you already have a software account um, and you have an Airtable account and you're seeing this, right? The other thing I just wanted to give you a heads up on is earlier there were only 14 records, but now because I signed up using test brand and my name and my website, it's been added to the Airtable also, right? You can see that. I'll just go ahead and quickly delete it because that was just a test record. That's not needed. So what I'm going to do is we'll get started on building the software app. Okay, let's get started. So in order to build an app that looks something like this, we can actually use a, an existing software template. So what we do is we go to templates on the top. This is the home page when you sign in. Click on new application. And actually speaking, this is, this is the first template that you will see. But if you can't see it for some reason, then go to internal tools on the left. And then when you go down right at the bottom, the last entry, it's called employee directory. That is the template we'll be using. You could check out other templates as well once the session is done and you have a little bit of um, confidence on building your own thing. But for now, let's just use this template and I'm gonna click on use template. When you click on use template, what software will do is it'll create a website for you based on this template and it will give it a dummy name. It will create all the pages that are there in the template and they will be ready for you to pre-populate with your data. But your data is on the air table, right? It is like this, right? It is like um, your, so, so if, if you want to display your Google Sheets data somewhere else, you need to first give that tool the permission to read your Google Sheet. So the way you do that is through something called an API. An AP, API stands for Application Programming Interface, which just means that it allows two apps to talk to each other. So if you ever connected your Google Calendar to another app, right, maybe a scheduling app, you, what you're doing is you're giving the API authorization. So it's basically you're authorizing this tool to read data from your Google Calendar. Similarly, right now, what you have to do is you have to authorize software to read data from your Airtable. Because you have duplicated this sheet, if you haven't duplicated this sheet, the way you can do it is when you open this, it will most likely say Vensi has invited you to check out this Airtable base. Uh, just you just sign on, sign in using a Google account, simple. On the and, and then you will be ending up in this at this page. On the top left, you can see the title of the of the Airtable base. And it says go green app, right? You can click on that. And when you, a small pop-up will come up. And on the right of that pop-up, there's three dots. This is where you have a duplicate base option. And if you click on that, the whole page that you're seeing will get duplicated onto your workspace. Right now you're seeing it in my drive, my Airtable drive. It's called an Airtable uh, workspace. You are just duplicating it onto yours so that you can play around with this data a little bit. So make sure that Go Green app is clicked, three dots, and then duplicate base. Make sure that is done. And then this, this same page will open as a new instance in a new tab. 
and uh, just make sure that the name is clear. It most likely is going to say go green app copy because you've copied it. You could probably rename it to something because we're going to be referring to that name a little bit later. Okay, so those are just a couple of uh, points to keep in mind. Okay, so what do we have to do now? We have to give software the permission to read this data. So software is a different company. Airtable is a different company. What you need to do is let software know. Uh, so we need to let Airtable know that it's okay for software to read our data. The way we do that is by adding a unique password that Airtable gives us. So Airtable says, if you ever want an app to read your data from Airtable somewhere else, then this is the password that you're going to that you're going to add there. How do you find that password? The easiest way to do that, and by the way, it's not called a password, it's called an API key. This is what software is asking us. Um, you could just click on this button to say how to, to, to see how to find an Airtable API key and it opens up the right page um, right here. It'll give you a little bit of information on how to find this, but the way you can do it from Airtable then whatever base you're in, it will work for all bases, is on the top right, you have your account image. Just click on that and it says account details. So just click on account to learn more about the settings, change some of the settings of your account. But in the bottom, it says API, right? So it says, this is your personal API key and it has access to all the data in your Airtable basis. So you have to be very careful if you ever think that someone has access to this password, make sure that you regenerate it so that you have a fresh one, okay? All you have to do is click on it, right click and copy it. Now that you're seeing this, if you type this in software, you will get access to my Airtable base, basis, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change my Airtable key. I'm just gonna click on regenerate after this session is done. That's a good practice for you as well. So all you have to do is copy that and just paste it here and connect to Airtable. As long as that API key is correct, software now has permission to read all your data on API. So first thing, what software is gonna say is make sure that you've co copied the template base. So it's just saying, have you copied the template base? The thing is we already have, but if you haven't, then just click on template base. So what it does is it's gonna give you uh, a link to another Airtable base because they clearly have built that template and on, a, on an Airtable base that looks something like this. But the thing is we already have an Airtable, right? Here. So we don't have to duplicate that. I'm just gonna close that. Uh, but only when you click on copy, this template base does this gets activated. So you have to click on that button first. I don't know why they've done that. This is where we have to type the right name, right? Earlier, uh, you rename the uh, the Airtable database to something. You see, I've actually used this app in a couple of places. So it's giving me three different names. Go Green App is the name of my base here. You can see Go Green App without any other words attached. So that is the right database that I'm going to connect it to. So now it's saying, so first you're basically connecting it to Airtable. The second thing is you're going to choose the right Airtable base from all the bases there are. So what I mean by that is when you actually sign up for Airtable, there's actually just like in how, in, in look, if you go to sheets.google.com, there are a bunch of Google Sheets you can add, right? In the same way, you can add a bunch of Airtable bases here. What, just one of them is the one that we'll be using in this table. And therefore uh, you have to give the, the access to the right page here. So go green app is the one we've selected. And now we're going to connect it to the Airtable because this is the one that we wanted to connect to. So that's actually it. That's all you need to do. Those are the two steps you need to do to make sure that you have an app built on software and it is connected to the right database. Now what Airtable, now what software is doing is it's creating a template um, of a website that's built using the template that we've chosen and the database that we have connected it to. It's a little slow if it if you ever find that software has gotten uh, slow, just refresh the page and it usually makes it a little faster. Glide is actually much faster than software, by the way. If you're interested in building something really light and lightweight, uh, Glide is better for you. 
So the reason why it's taking so much time is because it already has all of these pages that it has created for you, right? And it has a bunch of logic on who can see what page and all of that. That's the reason why it's taking a little bit of time. Usually it doesn't take this long. It's probably my internet as well. So you could explore that a little bit. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through what we're seeing on the page first before we start building. The first thing that probably sticks out to you is that there are two headers. There's one header uh, that says sign in with the sign in button. The second one is similar, but with three different buttons. And you're like, why does it have three different, uh, two different headers? That's a good question. We'll get to that in a bit. Next, it has a pretty um, heading. We can change that. If you click on this, you can change the title here. Next, and you can close this menu on the right. Next, we see an empty directory. It just says no results found because we haven't set it up. And then we have a login prompt with some dummy details on the, the uh, dummy accounts that we can use. Some of these blocks that we're clicking, so for instance, when we click on the login block, it is actually giving us a prompt here saying there's a new version of this block available. So if you're not seeing the same kind of menu on the right that I'm seeing right now, it's because you have the newest version of that block installed. But suffice it to say that it's going to be the same features. It's probably going to be in different places in the tabs. It's going to be the same. And then finally, you have a footer, right? Today, we're going to only focus on two things. We're going to focus on building this page. And we're going to build the form that updates this page. So that's all we're going to do. That's the create and that's the read part of a CRUD app. So the first thing we're going to do, because we've taken all of this time to uh, to duplicate an Airtable database that is populated with all of this data is we're going to display this data on this page. That's the first thing we're going to do. So where do we display that? Well, this template already has a database set up for us. It's just that it's not displaying anything because it's not set up properly. How do we do it? This is what software makes it easy on the UX building part. So just click on this block. And then on the right, again, it's giving you a prompt, right? It says update block. Make sure that you update it so that you're on the latest version of software. And now it's saying unable to fetch base tables and all of that, right? The reason it's that it says that is because we haven't set it up yet. So let's go ahead and do that. Airtable base, we've already connected it in step one. So go green app, make sure that is selected. Within Airtable bases, you know how Google Sheets actually have different tabs in the bottom? The same way, Airtable has tables on the top. So right now we have table one that's opening up for us, but we also have other tables that we can add or import. Today we have two tables on this template that I've given you. One is table one, which let's just take a look at it. It says name of the brand that you're recommending to the people. What does this brand do? A little bit of description, their logo in the form of a picture, the website to reach that website, and then the category of this company. Very basic data categorization. The second table is about users. So email of the user who signs up, the name of the user, the date the user was created. Magic link is basically the link that they can use to sign up quickly. And then a picture, like a display picture that they can choose for their account. Now, these are the tables that are there on the base. But on this particular directory that we're seeing on the home page. We want the brands to show up, right? We're displaying the names of sustainable brands. So the Airtable table that we want to choose is table number one. That's the name of the table that we're seeing. You can rename it and then it will show the right name. But now it says table one. The next thing is it's going to now populate with some dummy data with the same picture and name. So in order to tell software where to take this particular picture from, the name, everything, that's step number two. So we've chosen the Airtable table. Further, let's say if you were to filter these results a little more, this is why Airtable is more powerful than Google Sheets. You can actually categorize this data further by, let's say we can create a new view, either by clicking on grid here or just duplicating the existing one. And then in this grid view copy, what I can do is I'm going to say filter where the condition is, where the brand category has any of food, let's say. 
So it will now show only the food brands that are here, right? So we have a couple of food brands here. And now in, I mean, it's just two, so it's okay, but let's say you have like 20,000 records. Maybe it makes sense to display only the food brands here. Then the default view, you can select it to have, you can refresh this to add the new tables that you've added there, new views that you've added on the table. So now when you've refreshed it, it will now give you uh, different tables, grid view and grid view copy. You can rename them again if you want to make it a little more actionable. For now, we're just going to say grid view. Okay, so now it knows where to pull that data from, but it still doesn't know what data to pull in. So what we're going to do is we're going to set it up. So first it's saying, do you want to sort it by in any specific way? Sort by maybe brand name A to Z. So ascending order alphabetically sounds good. Items per page six to 10, maybe 10 is fine or nine. And after nine is done, uh, if you have even more number of items in your database, it's going to say see more. And when you click on see more, it's going to display the others. Items per row, three or four. So basically when you have images on, so the list items on the right and the categories filter filters on the left, you can only display three because it doesn't have much space on the left. But if you change the style of list three on the, on the top, you have styles, right? If you go to styles and um, let's see if you can change it. Oh, you can change it on the styles. What you'll have to do is you can add a different type here, add a block. And you can say dynamic and in the list view. So you can see that you have all these different options, right? So you have options where the category categories are on the top. If you use that, then you can display four in the list. For now, we can't do that because it's already taking, the categories are already taking that space. No problem, three is fine. And then if the database is empty, what should it say? Well, it's for now, it's just saying no results found. Try adjusting your search and filters. You could just add a custom um, message if you would like. But because our database actually has 14 records here, that's the reason why it's not showing that error message anymore. Okay, you can uh, condition you can filter more by conditions here if you want. For instance, you can say where the brand category is not food then it will, it will not show the food items here on software. So this, these categorizations, so these filters you can set up here or you can set up on Airtable also. It works both ways. Next, let's go to features because that is where we want to change what we're seeing on, on the website. So first of all, it's asking you, what kind of filters do you want customers? To, do you, what filters should users be able to see? Right now it's saying filter by office and filter by blank. So that's what it's saying, filter by office. We could say filter by category because we have categories in our database. So now the label has changed to filter by category on the top, right? So here, now it's gonna ask you, what is this filter coming from? Where is this coming from? Well, that filter is coming from the category column of our database. And if you double click this column on Airtable, you'll see all the categories that there are here, right? So cosmetics is a category, transport, electric, food, home products, and all of that. So filter by category and automatically it has filled all these options, see? And then you could see which of these options should be visible. If you don't toggle them on, they will not be visible here, which is why there's only five. But if you tick all of them, all of them will be visible, right? You can choose what options to display here. Uh, the other way in which you can change the positioning of the filter is by saying, not left, which is by default, but maybe by maybe on the right, if you like that, or on the top in this way, right? And you could display this either as a list, like one, two, three, four, like that, or as a drop down where it will collapse all of that into a drop down. When they click on that, they can select what they want. I like drop downs better because it conserves space. So I'm going to leave it that way. And uh, do you want people to select more than one? What if I want to select? Brands that are both food and uh, home products, right? In the, then I will select more than one. So I'm going to allow multi-select. That's completely fine. And then software allows you to add as many filters as you want. So I can say where the category is cosmetics and the brand name starts with P 
and the description contains the word India. You can add as many filters as you want here. For now, I'm going to keep it really simple and I'm going to delete this other filter by category because I don't think we have so many items anyway. So I'm going to click on filter settings here and uh, I'm going to click on these three dots. They're, little, they're very faint, but they're there. You can click on those three dots. You can click on delete. So now we have just deleted that part of the filter altogether. You can add as many as you want. You can add them later also. The next thing is uh, the search bar that you're seeing on the top. You can customize that a little bit. You can say search for your favorite brands, let's say. And that's what that label, that's what the placeholder search will say. Now it's gonna ask you, okay, if someone types a search query, where should I search that information from? Where should, I, where should I get that information from? So you could select that here. You could say they have to find it in the category or the description. Description is fine. Uh, they should be able to search for brand names also, categories as well, and maybe websites as well. It's, it's good to make it as extensive as possible, right? Because that keyword might be anywhere. Finally, you could add a see more button. And uh, instead of it having that label see more, you could say, visit website. Now you can't see that populating here because the button isn't visible here because it doesn't know what to do when it clicks on the button. So that's what we're going to set up now. That's the last part of this page. Now it's saying I have all of these item fields here. Where do I get that data from? The first thing is the image. And the thing is, I've already added all these images for you here. So we already have a column. So the first thing is we're going to get that image the type of this column is an image column and that content, because we've already selected that database there, the content is coming from the picture column. You see, it's called a picture column. You can call it whatever you want, image media. But if you collect, connect the picture column, you have these images showing up immediately, right? Beautiful. The second thing is it has H3, which is the heading, uh, which is the name, but it's blank now. When you click on heading and uh, H3 and name, the content is coming from name, let's say brand name. Now you have the brand name coming up here, seventh generation, beyond me, green leaves, etc. cetera. Uh, it's a little too small for my taste because I want it to be a little larger. Uh, I believe that's happening because it's sort of, it's not meant to be the heading. So let's go ahead and customize that heading a little bit. So be, be, uh, so under brand name, there's another text option, right? Let's click on text and see what's happening here. Well, it's blank. So you can't see anything here. So type is text, which is fine. On three dots on the, on the right, let's click that and see style. What's happening here? So it is, the, the text size is actually large here. And the font weight is normal. Let's make it maybe bold for now. And then let's go back and connect this text to the brand name. And let's see what happens. So you can see that the first line could probably be a category. The second line could be the name of the brand. Let's stylize that a little bit. What I'm teaching you right now is just formatting. So the brand name, in the first instance, let's change that to category instead. And you can see what's happening here, right? So Beyond Meat is a food product and that's the reason why it's showing in this way. So let's stylize this a little bit. So this category, three dots on the right, style and open sans for the font family is okay. Letter spacing, instead of normal, I will say tight so that it's a little smaller, let's say tighter, even better. And semi-bold semi or normal, normal is even better. Is This is okay. Um, maybe medium, this is cool. So what I want here is for it to have a text color, text color green is okay. What I wanted for it to do is change the, uh, so make it, make it distinct from the title of the brand. So I'm gonna go ahead and stylize the brand name, three dot style. And I'm going to say font family, maybe Oswald this time. And the font weight could be, bold is fine. Letter spacing could be maybe a little wide. 
Oswald is not great for that. Inter is a little better. Okay. And maybe the text size could be a little bigger. Mm -mm, that's not great. Let's play around with this a little bit. This is better. This is okay. So we have some distinction between the category and the title. The next thing is maybe a snippet of the description of what the brand does, right? So let's go to the next text option. And so see, you can see uh, the I option and the I is crossed out, which means that it is invisible right now. If I click on show, it is now going to show a single line short text that is aligned to the left. If you like that, that's great. Otherwise, uh, just go back and toggle it back to hide. And then the last text is already being shown. And the content for this can be pulled from the description. What happens then is we see a snippet of the description that's being displayed here. That's cool. The last thing we want to do is we want to add a field, which is the button field. Let's search for a button. Is there a button? Yes, there is a button. And the label on this button should say visit website. Okay, so now we have a button on the bottom that says visit website. Again, if I click on the three dots here, I can stylize it to align to the center, which is a little better and coherent. And the last thing I have to do is say, when someone clicks on the website, what should happen is that they should be redirected to the link that's there in the respective row. So if they click on tree card fabrics, they should go to this link and so on. So what should happen is the action here is that it should open, well, it should open a page, it should open a link. Should it open a page? Should it scroll to a section or should it open an external URL? If it is a page, it's actually pertaining to a page within software. So on the left, you have all these pages, right? So if you wanna open one of those pages, then you have to click that. Or if you already have a section on the page that you wanted to scroll to, then that's what scroll to section does. But what we want it to do is open an external URL, which means it will go to another website altogether. What is that website? Well, we already know what that website is that can be taken from this particular column. So all we have to do is select this row and click on the website because that is the URL, the name of the URL column. That's all we have to do. If you wanted to open a new tab, all you have to do is click here and it's a little cleaner that way. And the last thing that software is going to ask you in any list is if you click on the button, that's what happens. That's all fine. But what if you click on the rest of the, the box? Like if you click somewhere else on the item box, what should happen then? Well, right now it's not doing anything. So item on click, on clicking one of these boxes, what should happen? Right now it's doing nothing. Or you could do the same thing as visiting the website. So instead of clicking just this button, even if you click on the rest of the box, you could still be re redirected to the website. Then action could still be again, open external URL. And the URL comes again from the website. You could do that and again, open in a new, new tab. Or... One other thing that software allows you to do, and I'd like you to see what's happening here. Um, go green app, right? So what's, what's happening here is when you click on visit site, let's go to beyond meet and click on visit site. When you click on the button, it takes you to the website. But if you click anywhere else on this box, then it's opening a page within our website that's giving you a little more uh, so de a little more detailed view of the same card. You can add many, many more details here, by the way. You can add like five more columns on this particular page and show those columns here, the data coming from those columns here. You can do all of that. So this is an option. If you have that much data, you can show all of that here. Where is this useful? Let's say you want an option for people to see uh, their profile pages. You can connect this page to the user table and display their user picture, user name, location, display, uh, you know, description, et cetera. So for instance, if it's a social networking site that you're building on software, this is how you would do it. Similarly, if it was an e-commerce website, this is what you would do to open the product page. And this call to action would be buy now. You could do that as well. Amazing. Great. So for now, I'm going to keep it really simple. I'm just letting you know that you can 
make it as complex as you would like but right now we're just going to leave it here and item on click will still take it to the website now before you lose any of this progress because we're done with the first page on the top right you have the publish option just click on that to make sure that you publish it so before you publish you could actually change the domain here uh, right now it gives you a, a, a random word but you could say founder uni test let's say and I'm going to click on publish. So once you click on publish, yeah. Uh, does anyone have a question? Stefan, did you have a question? No? Okay. Great. Sorry, can you repeat that, please? Okay, I'm not sure if that was a question. Let me go ahead continue. So th that confetti there is uh, showing you that it's been published. And therefore, when you open this link now, you, you can either copy the link from here or you can open to see what you've built. And you can see that the name that you've added gets displayed correctly. If it doesn't, no worries, you can go back and change that. So this is where stuff gets a little confusing. You're like, this is not what I built. Where is the database that I've built just now? Why is it not showing up? And what's up with this header being displayed in, in just uh, one strip, where's the other strip going? Whenever you are unable to see data in the published version of any page, and it's not just software, this is a tip for any, any other no-code tool as well, it is most likely because of visibility settings. How do you toggle visibility settings? Each tool has an easy way of doing it. On software, you're, if you're not seeing this table being displayed on your page, it's because it's not visible to all users. Where do you change that visibility settings? Well, we've set, we've set all of these features already, right? The fourth tab on the top is called visibility. And on the visibility, what we're going to do is we're going to say, it's right now it's visible only to logged in users, which means that if I go and sign in, here, let's say, with a dummy data, um, with some dummy data, which software gives us, by the way. So when I've signed in, I can suddenly see it now, right? So that happens because this table is only visible to logged in users. So if I click on all users, it is now going to display to everyone whether they're logged in or not. If you click on non-logged in users, it will only be displayed to people who are not logged in. When is that useful? Well, you could make the detailed page. You know, Remember how I showed you when you click on this detailed page and I said um, it, should, it should show, give me a second. So when, when I open Beyond Meet, and I said, you can show the user details here. I can make this specific to users themselves. So I, I, it will only be displayed if you are signed in. And if you're not signed in, maybe I can have, an, have a prompt that says, you're not signed in, please sign in to view it. In that case, I'm going to go ahead and change this to non-logged in users. But if I click on all users, then everyone, whether they're logged in or not, will be able to see it. Right now, I would like them to be able to see it. So now when I refresh this page, you can see the directory in the way that we have built. And whenever I click on each of these boxes, it will open its website, the respective website. Great. Similarly, using the same logic, that's probably what's happening with the headers also, right? Let's go ahead and check that out. Let's click on the first header block. And first it's saying update block. Well, let's just update it. Just make sure that we're on the latest version of software. Update it. If you go to visibility, it's now saying that it is only visible to non-logged in users. So if I'm a non-logged in user, the only thing I can see on this website is a prompt for me to sign in. That makes sense, right? The next one, the next header, again, update block. You only have to do it once in a session, like once when you're building the app, by the way. So that should be okay. Then you go to visibility and it is only visible to logged in users. So either I'm able to do stuff as a logged in user or I'm being asked to log in, right? It's either or. And therefore, I'm, I'm, I can see only one of those instances of that header. So if this is when I'm logged in, when I sign out, it is now showing me 
the header that is visible to non-signed users, okay? So that was visibility settings. You can play around with visibility settings to build incredibly, incredibly complex apps. So that's a very useful tool. So you can even toggle device visibility. What if you don't want this entire image to show up on a phone? Then I can toggle this to not show up on the phone. See, it's grayed out now. So it saves some space. It, you can you can you can you can um, make your app a little faster that way. You can also add custom user groups. So you can say paid users. So not just signed in users, but paid users. Not just paid users, but paid users from the UK. And they should only be able to see this ad, for instance. So all of that can be customized here as well. So like I said, using this logic, you can build an incredibly complex e-commerce platform or a marketplace or a community, et cetera, et cetera. Great. So what we're going to do is we're going to change. The, so we're going we're gonna, to we're going to the last part of today's build, which is the second page, which is the create aspect. So, you know, you see all of these uh, brands here, but there's only 14 of them. You want the ability you want to give the uh, users the ability to add more brands to this you, they want to be able to create their own recommendations and create their records onto this Airtable table of course you can give them the access to the Airtable base and say add it to this base but when they when you have 10,000 users for instance you can't do that right and the other way where it's useful is let's say this is uh, Facebook's friends list your 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 list of friends Every time someone signs up and they get added as your friend, they should be displayed on this list, right? And so that is the way they're creating a record on this page. So we need to create a way for them to add a record to this page. And the way we'll do it is by adding a simple form. How do you do that? Well, on the first heading, a first header, it says sign in. And I'm going to leave it at that because I don't want anyone to be able to fill the form. I want them to fill the form only if they're signed in. Because it makes sense, right? You need to sign in and say, this is who I am. And this is why you should trust my recommendation. And then the, the admins can accept that recommendation. So the second header, which is only visible to logged in users. So when I've logged in, I want to be able to submit uh, the form. So the features of this header right now, you have um, a logo on the left. You can update that image. There are stock photos that are there. There are illustrations that software has used. For now, maybe we could, well, we could probably upload something from your computer. Like that's an option. Mm, let's see if there's any thumbnail. Yeah, let's add Bubbles logo for now. Oops, okay. So we've uploaded it to our assets library. I'm gonna say use asset. And now you can, that's how you actually change the logo on the header. It's as simple as that. Um, the second thing that you have to customize are the links that you're seeing on the right, department, submit expenses, book time off. Because this is an internal directory, this is an in intranet, it's an employee directory. That's the reason why all of these are default pages. I will now go and probably delete the links that I'm, that I'm seeing here. So link options, uh, three dots, delete. Submit expenses, three dots, delete. Book time off, three dots, delete. I'm gonna build one more link from scratch, that's okay. And the last thing I wanna do is change the name. Employee directory should become green brands. Cool. Okay, I'm gonna click on the header again to change some of this stuff. Um, you could add links, which will be displayed in the form of a text like that, or you could add a button, which will be added like a button. In link name, you could just say, home and every time they click on home if they're on another page they will be sent to home so if that should be a nested menu where you can say about us and then under about us you could say vision statement guiding uh, values and all of that you can add a sublink here I don't want to make it complicated but you can it's good to know that you can make it as complicated as you want and when I click on home the action there should be not scroll to an external URL this time because we already have that page on this website. So I'm gonna say open page. So all the list of pages that you have here will be displayed here. And I just wanted to 
go to home. Now, the thing about software is that it is going to display pages always in an alphabetical order ascending. So I'm going to search for home, click on home, and that's it. I don't want it to open on a new tab. Okay, so home will go to home. And the button is going to say submit a brand. So if you have a recommendation, this is how you will do it. When you're signed in, you can submit a brand. And that is it. When you click, when you click on this button, I'm going to add an action, which will take them to the form. We do not have the form yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly publish this for now. Create. And I'm going to go to pages and I'm going to see, I'm just going to add a new page. That's fine. Add a new page and the page name could be submit brand save. So this page has been created, submit brand. And now it is going to be empty because we have not selected any template for it. If the page is empty, all you have to do is click on the plus button on the in the center to add a new block. And then all you have to do is search for a form. Well, I can't see a form here. So you can search for it in dynamic. You still can't see it was here, but if you still can't see it, search for it on the top. And you could select the form that you like. I am going to select um, this, the first one, just to make it really simple and really minimal. And this is it. So the last step and to, in today's build, the last thing we're going to do is we're going to set up this form so that every time this form is submitted, it updates this table. And you already know that whatever you add to this table is being displayed on the home directory already, right? So all you have to do is connect this form to that table. First of all, let's just set up this form a little bit better. It's a, it's a contact me form. So that's not relevant for us. So I'm just going to refresh it a little bit. Also, I'm using Safari, which is a really bad idea. You should definitely use Chrome. I forgot and I opened it in Safari today. I really shouldn't use Safari because you'll have to keep refreshing it. So title could say, submit your favorite brand. You could just say, same thing. You could give a few directions if you'd like here. Any background image? No, I'd like it to be white like this. It's good. Form position should be at the bottom or right like this or on the left, bottom, like title first and then form in the bottom is fine. Form destination. Now, this is the most important part. When I submit the data from this form, it should be sent to my database here. Whenever someone signs up for Facebook, it, that data gets sent to their database. Similarly, I want this data to be sent here. That's what I need to set up. Where's the destination? The destination is going to be an Airtable base. For example, if this was an email submission form, then you might want to send that data to MailChimp as a new subscriber. MailerLite could be sent to Zapier or Make, which are both automation platforms. You could check that out later if you're interested. Or all of this data could just be CC to your email. So I could just say forward your email, send it to venc089 at gmail.com, which is my personal email. And every time someone submits this form, I get an email saying, hey, Vensi, someone spilled your form. I'm going to check this out. But let's say 100 people sub sub submit that form. I don't want to check my email for that, which is why I'm connecting it to my Airtable. So I'm going to say send to Airtable. The Airtable base is going to be the same one as before. Go green. Make sure the title is correct. And the table. It shouldn't be users, it should still be table one. So table one is where it needs to go. The last step is you have to map each of these form input fields to the right column, right? The brand name should be sent here, the description here, image here, and so on. So that's what we're going to set up. This is the last step of setting up this form. What the fields that you're seeing on the left are on the right here. The first one's asking for your name. It is a text field. Make sure that is the same field that you're seeing. This is a text field on Airtable and it says brand name here. So it is a text field, which is fine. Placeholder should say not your name, but brand name. And the field that it should map to is the brand name. Okay. It is required. You can toggle the settings here, required or not. 
Then is an email address. I don't need an email address. So either I delete this here or I change the type of e uh, field from email to description. So description is just a long text, right? And the placeholder could be description of the brand. And then the field that it should map to is the description column from the air table. This is, this is required too. Phone number, I don't even need a phone number. And what else is there? Picture, we do need a image logo, uh, image, right? Which is the logo. So I need this to be a file because images are files and placeholder should say brand logo, just to tell them that's what we're looking for. And when they submit it, the field that it should go to should be the picture field. And this is required too, because if you don't make this required, then the people will submit data that does, does not have a logo and then you have to update it later. So you could just toggle the requirement here itself. And then the last thing I wanna add is, so two things actually, website. So the first thing is you need the data for, for the website column because there will be a visit website button and you need it not to be empty. So type should be a URL and the placeholder should be website, um, brand website. That's what they have to enter here. When they submit that, the field that it will go to is the website field. This is required too. The last thing is the category. Category is a multiple select column. So that's what I'm going to select here. Drop down, multiple select drop down. The options you can add from here, whatever you want. Cosmetics, enter. Fabrics, enter. Food, enter, so on. Placeholder could be category. And then when they add the category, it should be mapped to category field. And this is required as well. Great. So the last, uh, and then after you submitted, what should happen? So first it's saying that the button is saying submit inquiry. That's not what we want. It will say, it should say submit brand. And then when they, subs, uh, when they click on this button, what should happen? Either they can be directed to the page that they have just created the if if you have items item details selected to open for instance if i go to go green app and i have just submitted tree card then when i click on submit maybe directly this page opens but in our case let them just see a message show a message saying thank you for your recommendation it has been added to the database to the home page, for instance. Great. So this is the prompt they'll see every time they submit something successfully. Cool. Now I'm just gonna say publish updates. Stuff has been published. Open a new tab and see what's up. It's first asking me to sign in because I'm not signed in. So I'm gonna first sign in. And now the brand page will be visible to us. Submit a brand form will be visible to us. Okay, troubleshooting 101. Why is this not opening? Because we have not set it up on the header. Go to the header, submit a brand. So you can only edit the header from the homepage. So go to the homepage first, go to the second header, and then select the button and see what's happening here. Well, when you click on the homepage, it's going to the home page. But when I click on the button, submit a brand, nothing is happening. So it's just refreshing the page. So I'm going to say add action. I'm going to say open the page called Let's search for it. submit brand, right? So now I'm going to say publish, publish. And now when I say submit brand, it's now going to open this page. There's going to be more troubleshooting here. So let's just say when see test one, description goes to it. Let's say brand logo will be just my name again. Just add that, it's okay. And website could be my website. And category, I'll just select one of those three cosmetics, let's say. I could select more than one, by the way, because this is a multi-select column. I can select more than one. See, there are a few products that have many. And I'm gonna say submit brand. And it has been done, it, it's been added. So thank you for your recommendation that has been added to the homepage. So if I go to the homepage now, as you know, all I have to do is 
see more. So that is troubleshooting. I have added, I have changed the name of see more to say visit website. So I have to change that to see more. So this button will say see more then. It's published before I forget. Okay, anyway, now you can see my brand here. If I select visit website, it will open my personal website because that is the link that I've added because that has been added as a new record here as a 15th one. When see test one, description goes here, image, link, and category. If I delete it from here, it will be removed from the home page as well. So this is your single source of truth. Anytime you want to edit the website, this is where you're going to change stuff. All right. And so now what you've done successfully is you've given people an ability to sign in and then submit a brand and edit the website that they're seeing on their, or on, on their uh, browser. Amazing. This is great. The last few things I want to tell you before I end this workshop and I can take Q and A is what you're seeing on the left. We haven't covered that much. So I just wanted to cover that a little bit. So if you go to pages and go to home page and click on the three dots here, it's going to give you an option of settings. If I click on settings, it's going to give you general name of the page, page URL, because it's home, you can't edit this, but everything else like SEO, which is the title. The title is what, so if you share this app right now on Twitter, this is a title that will show up on that card. This is a uh, description. You can further customize it on the social tab, social media title, social media description, and social media image. You can edit this on Canva. And visibility. Should this page, so you know how we've selected this table to be displayed only to uh, specific users or the header. If you don't want this whole page to even be displayed, then you can change that here. So only logged in users should be able to see a particular page. Then even if they have the address to that page, they'll still not be able to see it unless they're signed in, right? So you can change that visibility here. Similarly for all the other pages also, let's go to submit brand and go to the three dots here. Submit brand three dots settings. You can change the same thing. General, you can change the name of the uh, page. We you remember, if, uh, if you remember, we actually added that while creating the page, but we can change that later also. SEO, social, default header and footer. Like you can create like five different headers and footers if you like, and the default one can be used or something else can be used here. So which one should be visible here? Um, visibility, what, what kind of user should be able to visit this page or to be able to read data on this page. And if they're not lo logged in, it will just say, hey, you're not logged in. Before you can visit this page, you should log in. The next tab I wanted to tell you about is the theme. You know how we were able to change the colors of some of this stuff by, so for example, if you want to change the color of visit website, this button, then I would go to features here, go to button, visit website and click on these three dots and then stylize it here, right? And change the color here in this way. Instead of doing that, you could just go to the theme and edit the whole theme here. And then it will be changed site-wide. Next, if you have a user sign-in option on your website, and most apps do have it, you can change uh, some of the settings related to users here. By default, you, uh, software gives us two dummy accounts. These are the accounts that we're using to sign in on the app just to check out how it works. But if you have a sign-in option, if you have a sign-in form, sign-up form, you could add the option to send that data. Remember how we sent the data to the form from the form to this Go Green app? Instead of that, that data could be sent to the user's table instead, right? So if it's a sign-up form, you can send that data to the user's table instead. And then you can add, you can add that table here, okay? So edit connection change it to go green app, change the uh, table to users. The email field will be the email field. That's important because that will be the user sign in. Okay, that's where you can change that setting. If you want to change other site-wide settings, this is the option the, at the end. 
which is general your domain if you have a domain that you wanted to go to uh, go green app.com instead of dot software dot app this is where you will change that integrations this we've already integrated it with airtable but you can integrate it with other tools as well you could check that out if you'd like User groups and permissions, I explained it to you. You could set up specific users like signed in and paid users from UK. So if you have those groups, then you can show specific targeted information to those groups. Then um, mobile app looks very much like an actual mobile app, like a progressive web app. If you don't know what that is, let me give you an example. This is a progressive web app. If you open this uh, on the phone, this this particular phone that you're seeing here, that is the only thing that you'll see. You'll not see all of this this stuff. You'll not see all of this stuff. So what you're seeing here is a progressive web app. And you can build that using software also, but it's a paid feature. On Glide, it's free. So uh, by the way, this, this was built using Glide. Um, SEO, this is site-wide SEO, Google site verification. If you have a marketing team, they can use all of this. But you can actually learn it on your own. I learned it when I was building my first ever website and there's a bunch of free tools, uh, free resources on YouTube. Any custom code if you want to inject, but again, as you can see, it's a paid feature. Email signature, uh, you know how everyone's, every time someone signs up, they get a an, get an welcome email on any website. This is the sender name and sender email that you can use there. You can configure that here. And uh, if you have many, many users, uh, make, most likely your emails will get flagged as spam. In order to avoid that, you can configure this SAML, which is like a mass emailing system. Many services offer that. So open ID settings that security. So as you can see, the whole point of showing you these features is to show that as you scale and as your app scales, software will scale with you and you can continue to build even more complex uh, you know, features, you, you can, you can max out all the facilities, uh, functionality that, uh, software is giving you before you hire a tech team and code it out. You can do all of this on your own, even without a team. And as you can see, I built this in like 20 to 30 minutes, right? As you get better at this, the moment you have an idea, you just build this out. It'll take you hardly like, you know, like 20 minutes to build stuff. Let me give you an example of a website that did really well that I built on software. I built this website in one hour. Just a little bit of context. HiIQContent.com. Balaji Srinivasan is a very famous um, Twitter celebrity. He actually started a thread one day saying, uh, where are all of these high IQ content resources? You know, do you have any recommendations? And a bunch of people started posting to that thread. So I collected all of those resources and uh, basically put them in an air table. And I connected that air table to this directory, to this software app. And of course I worked a bunch on this design and I tweaked a bunch of, so most of the time, uh, the time, the mo most of that time actually went towards the design and the logos and all of this. Uh, but can, you know, building the directory itself was fairly straightforward. All I did was compile the resources from that Twitter thread, screenshotted it, screenshotted the homepage of that website as the image and added that in the image field. But we've done all of this today already, right? And when they click on this, they actually are direct, redirected to the website because I've given the link to that website in the Airtable column, right? So I just wanted to show this in action on, on how this is useful. I built this in one hour because and because it was Balaji, he reshared it um, and you know we got thousands of users in just 24 hours. And it was a fun project to work on. And this is, these are the kind of projects that you work on to sort of build your developer muscle. And then when you actually have a really big idea, you have all of these tools at your disposal. Similarly, uh, I actually hadn't used Glide before building this app, but I knew the logic of connecting, you know, Google Sheets or databases to app builders. And so because I had a bunch of practice on Bubble, it was easy for me to build this. Uh, I built this tool called HYD. So it was a COVID response app for India uh, that I built in the heart in in the in the middle of the COVID, the second COVID wave in 2021. I built this app in two hours using a tool called Glide, which is very similar to Softer, and uh, we actually served 
hundreds of thousands of users using that app because it was built at a time of need and it was launched really quickly. So I hope I was able to convince you of the power of no code today. And I hope I was able to convince you of the simplicity and ease of use as well. And uh, I hope that you built something in this session. If not, the I'm, I'm available for any questions if you need any help. Otherwise, I would love for you to post a screenshot of whatever you've built. Take a little more time if you'd like, but please, uh, please post a screenshot of whatever you've built on Twitter and tag me so that I can reshare it. And the best entries, I'm actually hosting a giveaway. The best entries will get a free template of your choice from my Gumroad store. Check it out, see whatever you like. Um, so that's the giveaway that I'm hosting right now. I have a few more resources that I've added on the uh, worksheet. So do check it out later if you're interested. The last couple of things I wanted to tell you is um, the best way to learn no code is by building in public. The best way of creating, um, well, basically the initial hype for your products is also by building in public. So I have a, a video and a post here on this link. If you're just getting active on Twitter, I do have a free Twitter growth playbook that you can use, you can download. And um, if you were wondering how I built this website on uh, how I built this website, I, this entire website is actually based on Notion. You know how this entire website is based on Airtable here? Similarly, this entire website is based on Notion. Um, so if you were wondering how Notion can be used as a database management solution, then you can click on that link to be taken to that tool. And finally, you can sell, you can check out a few Notion templates that I have if you're interested. That's about it. If you're wondering how that HYD COVID resources app was built, I actually also hosted a live session that trained thousands of people on building their, building their own emergency response apps for their communities last year. So the, the, the video is right here. You can check that out and it will give you a really good background on how to build a Glide app, similar to how you've built a software app today. So if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise we can end the session soon. Hi, Vancy, Qu quick question. Um, mm -hmm. I think David also asked that question. Um, can you go, what are the pros and cons of using softer, softer um, in contrast with bubble? Great question. Okay, so in all honesty, I actually started my NoCo journey with bubble. Like I lo started learning bubble, but that's because I actually didn't know about Glide and softer. And uh, it took me about a month to launch my first app on bubble. So, and that was me actually putting in a ton of reps every single day. So the thing about Bubble is it is incredibly powerful. Uh, and, but with all of that power comes a lot of learning, uh, a very steep learning curve as well. And so if you have that kind of requirement coupled with that kind of time, then it makes sense to use Bubble. But most people, like I would say 90% of people who are looking at no-code no code tools, um, they all they need is software or Glide. They do not need to go to Bubble. Because you, you, you saw how easy it was to build this, to, this, this particular di uh, directory today, right? On Bubble, it would take you many, many hours to build the same thing. And then the next thing is it will not look good in this way. It, it's, it's definitely not going to look like this. It does not have these templates and all set up that are responsive. But what do I mean by that? Let's say I reduce the size of this browser, right? You can see this uh, directory squeezing down as well. All of this, you have to set it up step-by-step step on Bubble. And it's really useful, right? That feature is really useful, but it's not really needed much. So I would say start with a simpler tool. Start with Google Sheets and then Glide. Start with Airtable and then Software. And then once you get a hang of visibility settings um, and user groups and stuff like that, conditional logic, then you can move on to Bubble. And you have a little more time. Vensi? Go ahead, David. Hi. Thank you so much for answering that. Now I have a, a follow-on question. Mm -hmm. What I'm building actually does require a lot of database stuff and a lot of workflows. Um, mm -hmm. I've built, I built my whole thing out in Excel and Google Sheets, and now I need to get it online. 
um, and it, and I'm in a program that's recommending bubble. So in that context, could you, if, since, since I do need heavy data based stuff, heavy workflows, is bubble the solution or should I try something else first? So I would say you should probably check, check it out on software first, uh, because you're saying you've built it out on Excel. Which, which makes me feel like you already have your data and you know your your categorization filtering all of that you you have an idea of, of how that works and how, what what should happen so i would say you should check it out on software first because it's very powerful and it's getting uh, more powerful by the day glide is really powerful as well both software and glide are useful really useful for making crud apps and if you believe, and then there are also Glide experts and software experts out there in case you run into any difficulties. Um, and so it'll take a really, it, it will it will definitely be shorter. It'll take, it'll take a shorter amount of time for you to figure those things out than compared to Bubble. And even building that MVP will probably take you a couple of hours before you understand if you're running into any obvious roadblocks. If you are, then it makes sense to build it out on Bubble. Um, okay. but I would recommend you talk to the team because both software and glide are really responsive, uh, to users requirements. And so if you really needed, uh, a, a, a feature that is a deal breaker for you, they're most likely going to listen to you and help you out there. So I would say exhaust all of these options before going to bubble because bubble does have a learning curve. Cool. Thank you so much. That's really helpful and really timely for me. Sure. Awesome. Okay. Uh, really if you know. If if you if you ever need any help with just just figuring some of that stuff out, uh, the best way is to probably create a Loom video uh, and post it on Twitter. And there's a bunch of uh, people from the No Code community who are active and really ha helpful. Um, so if you ever run into difficulties, you could build in public and just make sure that people know what you're working on. I mean, if you're comfortable doing that. Um, otherwise, there are software experts, Glide experts who can help you out. Very cool. Thanks again. Great. Awesome. All right. Any other questions? Otherwise, we are reaching time and I could end the session. Let me end the recording.